Hi everybody, Russell Leidig here. We're going to have a lot of fun today. I'm going to introduce you to a new statistical analysis method that can be used to find deeply buried signals. Um, and first of all, this is a mathematically rigorous concept, but I'm not going to go into any of the math in this video um, because I just want to talk about it qualitatively for a bit. But if you do want all of the math uh, and the source code in C and Mathematica that you can actually put to immediate use, uh, you'll find it at my blog, which is displacidism.blogspot.com, and that is also linked in the YouTube description. All right, so what is the goal here? Um, well, the whole point of displacidism analysis is to measure the extent to which it is likely that a series of numbers, integers in particular, was generated randomly. And why would this matter? Well, because if you're looking for an interesting signal, uh, that probably means you're looking for something that looks like something other than random noise, right? So, uh, for example, here in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, we're looking for some kind of uh, signal from an ET indicating that, uh, that they have an intelligent uh, civilization somewhere, right? But it might not be that dramatic. It might be something as simple as uh, looking for a water deposit, for example, in, in a radar survey of the Earth. Uh, or looking for some kind of interesting correlation in genetic data. Um, and in all of these cases, uh, you have an enormous amount of data, and the vast majority of that data is basically random noise. It's completely uninformative. Um, and hopefully, here and there, there are a few little pinpricks of very useful information. And the question is, how can you find that information for a minimum amount of computational expense? So let, let's have a look at this example. So, all right, so here we've got a search for extraterrestrial intelligence radio telescope. And at this point, I guess they have 100 telescopes or something. And this one is pointed at this galaxy over here. And of course, it's looking at the radio spectrum. So we get this uh, analog radio noise coming in. And it's, it's basically a bunch of nonsense, right? So it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't look like any particularly intelligent signal. And we could digitize it here. And let's say we digitize it uh, to 8-bit bytes. So value 0 through 255. So we, we get this stream of bytes coming out. And of course, 0 would, would be the lowest uh, amplitude here, and 255 would be the highest, and in between would be everything in between. Simple enough. So what are we looking for in this case? Um, or for example, if we're trying to uh, home in on a uh, cell phone tower, right? we're looking for a carrier signal. Now, a carrier signal is a simple signal, like the sine wave here, or perhaps a sawtooth or a square wave. Uh, it, they call it a carrier signal because it carries a digital signal, and that's, that's the signal on which all the information is encoded. So the carrier itself really doesn't contain any information to speak of. Um, it's just a boring wave. Okay, so low information content, basically we've got a frequency and an amplitude, and, and that's about it. So it should be easy to find, but it's not that easy to find because it's complicated by environmental factors, which, which cause noise. So, right? so we, we send this beautiful carrier signal, and we end up receiving this pretty trashed up signal. Why? Well, there's attenuation because of distance, so, so the amplitude is, is severely reduced most of the time. Um, there's multipath problems, meaning that the signal may bounce up, split apart all over the place and then recombine, so you get echoes and so forth. And there's other random noise sources, and then there's a local noise source due to the receiver. And at the end of the day, you, you just get this really ragged thing coming in. Now, fortunately, for this kind of problem, uh, we solved it like two or three hundred years ago with Fourier transforms. A Fourier transform is technically an analog transform, so we have this f of x, which is in this case the fast Fourier transform, which is a digital transform that simply takes this digitized, very dirty uh, signal, which looks something like a sine wave, and we pass it through this fabulous transform, and out comes this wow signal where we can see that uh, the dominant carrier frequency is, or the dominant uh, sine frequency is this particular uh, frequency here, which is uh, no doubt the carrier signal. So we could actually reconstruct this as a pure sine wave, and its frequency uh, would, would probably match very closely with the original signal. 
So what's not to like? In fact, there's a whole bunch of similar transforms from which to choose. And if you want to look these up, there's a Fourier transform, heart wavelets, curvelets, brushlets, contourlets, wave atoms, wavelets. The list goes on and on. And all of them work well for some particular category of signals. For instance, Fourier transform works really well for sinusoids. Heart wavelets work a little bit better for step functions and so on. Um, but there's, there's just one problem. See, all these transforms have n log n computational complexity. And n log n just basically means for n sample points, the amount of time that it takes you, or I should say the amount of operations that you're required to do, um, is is proportional to n log n, and and generally speaking, this is uh, this is a, a pretty fast uh, algorithm. There's nothing to complain about, but unfortunately, we're talking about deeply buried signals. So again, we're talking about massive amounts of information, only a tiny fraction of which uh, may be informative. Um, so what ends up happening is that when we try to apply these transforms to this kind of huge data set, we got a lot of cache misses. So that, in other words, uh, we have to go far away from the CPU and the computer to actually acquire data every so often. And uh, if the data set's big enough, we might actually have to store it in the cloud, which means that we've got lost packets and network latency to deal with and all this stuff. And it just ends up being a very, very expensive n log n. So it's actually worse though, right? Because even once we've spent all this time and effort and we've done this complicated transform on any given data frame, and, and a frame is just simply a set of data. So, you, you know, who knows, maybe every, every second there's, let's say, a billion bytes that come off the telescope. So a frame is a billion bytes in this case. But anyway, once, once we've done all this work on any given frame, it's probably completely useless because in all likelihood, even, even if we're not doing something so dramatic as looking for ET, um, probably in this data, there's basically no signal at all. And we just wasted a bunch of time and, and energy. So it's worse than that, though. <laughs> Because unfortunately, all these transforms are really geared toward finding something akin to a carrier signal, some kind of uh, analytic function, a, a nice, smooth, differentiable function. It may be limited in spatial extent, like in the case of, of wave atoms, but it's still a, a relatively smooth function. But sometimes we're looking for an intelligent signal or an artificial signal, if you like, which is obviously contrived, but it's nothing like what would come out of analog physics. For, for example, you can see, you can easily see the pattern in this signal here. Any idiot could figure this out, except that none of the transforms I mentioned to you would actually pick up on this pattern. It's, 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 it's a pattern that, you know, may be obvious to the human brain, but, but uh, is not really going to resonate with any of the popular uh, transforms. So, so what do you do? You, you would really ideally like to have a mathematical tool which would detect both the nice, smooth, analytic carrier signal type of buried signals and also these kind of complex, intricate, uh, discrete uh, signals, if you will, that don't really uh, have an analytic quality to them. They're not really differentiable. Um, so what if there were a fast way to separate signals during acquisition, that is right when you acquire them, discarding the noise and preserving only the intelligent signals? So this is the goal of dysplosionism analysis. So let's revisit SETI, okay? So in, in this case, we can modify SETI to be much more efficient by doing the following. Uh, so we got these raw data frames coming in off the dish. You know, like I said, we can imagine they're like a billion bytes apiece, right? And each frame goes into the dysplosimeter. And it's not actually required that each frame is the same size, by the way. But if it's not, then the math gets a lot more complicated. So let's just assume that for the moment. And it, and it is a realistic assumption, right? So what this does is, is it measures the extent to which it is plausible that uh, the data was generated essentially at random, like by an unbiased random number generator. So over time, we can develop a distribution of uh, different dysplosionisms, which it, which is this, this metric of randomness. Um, and you know, th it it may be, for instance, that these raw data frames are are always somewhat non-random. For instance, because the signal doesn't eat up the entire range of zero to two fifty five most of the time, it's attenuated, right? So it's always somewhat random in the sense that very high values and very low values are particularly rare. But even so, we still know that that most of this data is is not going to be informative at all. 
So what we could do, for instance, is watch like, let's say, 100,000 frames go by and, and build up some kind of distribution of dysplosionisms. And we'll say, for sake of argument, that only the, you know, the top 1% or I, I should say the, the, uh, yeah, the, the top 1% of dysplosionisms, um, which means that they're in the top 1% of non-randomness, are worth analyzing. So what do we do? So, so the bottom 99% that has this low dysplosionism goes into the trash can. We don't waste any time analyzing that at all. And only the highest 1% of dysplosionism ends up being forwarded to this huge supercomputer, which is our slow broadband signal analyzer. So this signal analyzer does all kinds of super complicated analysis. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about here that tries to chase down uh, an intelligent signal. And again, it's possible that uh, the dysplosimeter might miss something because it looks random, but it contains an intelligent signal, or, or it might uh, much more likely send something to the broadband signal analyzer that really actually doesn't contain anything intelligent. So it's not perfect, obviously, but, uh, but it certainly can save a lot of time because look what we've done. We've thrown, say, 99% in the trash, which means we've multiplied the amount of time available to each frame analysis by a factor of 100. You know, so we could save money, we could save time, or we could do a lot more in-depth computation by using this strategy. Um, and as a result, hopefully at the end of the day, we increase our chances of finding the intelligent signal we're looking for um, within any given amount of time and money. So one way to enhance uh, the functionality of, of the dysplosimeter um, is simply differentiation. So uh, l let me just introduce this to you if, you if you're not familiar. Like in calculus, differentiation refers to essentially the asymptotic difference between uh, proximate points. Uh, in, in the discrete world, it's, it's really simple. It's just basically successive differences. Okay, so we start with 0, and then 28 minus 27 is 1, 30 minus 28 is 2, blah, blah, blah. Right? And we get rid of the sign because basically with the kind of analysis that we're doing, we're just really looking at complexity. We're not really concerned with uh, the direction uh, in which the signal is changing. So we just take absolute values. So look what happens. Uh, initially, we had a smattering of different values, and we could assume these are bytes uh, coming off the telescope, right? From 27 to 37, pretty much everything in between. And now we basically could represent every single byte with just two bits because it's just 0 through 3. So it's obvious that there's something smoothly varying here, which was not so obvious from the signal above. So, so doing this first derivative transformation just basically makes the dysplosimeter all the more sensitive. Um, eventually, given enough values, it would still realize that the signal on top was quite artificial. But um, if you want to get the most bang for the buck, I recommend doing this. Occasionally, the second derivative is more important, uh, is more informative. And occasionally, the signal itself is, is more informative. But as a rule of thumb, when you're looking for a smoothly varying um, analog carrier signal, you want to differentiate. Now, if you're looking for an intelligent signal um, of the sort that I showed you earlier with the zeros and ones, you probably would just retain the initial signal and look at that. All right, so let's, let's look at we, if we do this differentiation technique. What, what ends up happening? Well, in a smoothly varying carrier signal, <clears throat> of course, we, we get a lot of zero differences. In other words, you know, the byte n plus 1 is identical to byte n. happens all the time. Uh, we get a, a little bit less common. Um, the difference is, is 1. So the, so the byte n plus 1 is 1 more or 1 less than byte n. And, you know, differences of 2 are less common. And differences of 198 are really, really rare, right? But basically, we, we, we get this, this very steep drop off here. Whereas if we take a truly random distribution, uh, we just get this, this triangular distribution of first derivatives. And this, this kind of makes intuitive sense because there's only really two ways to get a difference of 255. You can go from 0 to 255 or 255 to 0. But you know there's like 200 ways um, to make a difference of like 55 or 54 if I'm off by 1 or whatever. But you, you get the idea. Right. So now, dysplosionism is, is not like measuring the curvature of this drop off or anything. It's, it's much more straightforward than that. It's purely a randomness metric. But in a qualitative sense, as applied to uh, continually varying carrier signals, you, you can sort of think of dysplosionism as saying, to what extent are we like this and not like that? All right. So dysplosionism can also help 
predict evolutionary complexity. Um, th this sounds like a huge departure from what we were just talking about, but it's really not. So basically when we're looking for a very faint signal or maybe a very strong signal that lasts only a very short amount of time, we're, we're looking for very subtle, very subtle statistical aberrations that deviate away from randomness, that alert us to the notion that maybe there's something interesting going on here. Well, this is very similar to um, simulations in which we are trying to predict the future state of a system. So for example, maybe we've got uh, an atmospheric simulation and we're bouncing gas molecules all over the place in three dimensions. And so th these are two dimensional vectors, but you can imagine them in 3D. So basically, <clears throat> these are velocity vectors of gas particles, right? So the, so the longer the vector, the faster it's moving. And then it, it, the arrowhead shows you which way it's moving. Well, let's say we got one simulation where the particles are looking like this. They're, they're, they're sort of kind of doing the same thing. Um, and then we have another simulation where it's just, it's just everything for himself, right? It's, it's all random, crazy motion, and there's no particular pattern. Which of these simulations would you dedicate more computer time to? Well, I would dedicate more time to this. Why? Because it seems like there's some kind of ordered complex, not not outright simple, but not chaotic behavior that's emerging. And we might learn something about how hurricanes or tornadoes or what have you uh, evolve if we put a lot of time and effort into this simulation. If we put the same amount of time into this simulation, uh, we're going to learn absolutely nothing. It's just noise. Um, and, and this potentially has even more profound uses. For example, imagine you're trying to find a drug that binds with a certain protein. Well, you could simulate instead of simulating, you know, 10,000 or 10 million frames of animation in this in the life of this protein as it moves around with this drug. You might only simulate the first 100 or 200 frames very cheaply, and then you realize from the velocity vectors of of atoms that are next to each other, if you realize that the displacentism is really high, in other words, there's a lot of order then maybe you want to continue simulating because it looks like there's crystallization or bonding happening, right? Whereas if you find out that uh, basically the atoms are bouncing all over the place, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get any kind of interesting drug reaction. So instead of wasting time on that simulation, you can spend a lot more time in analysis on the ordered simulation. Um, and and I, I won't get into it right now, but this, by the way, has uh, some interesting overlaps uh, with a concept known as the shrinking bullseye algorithm. All right. So I hope I whet your appetite, um, but I am going to show you now some actual practical examples of dysplosionism in action. And uh, just before I do that, let me mention again, uh, dysplosionism. Hi everyone, I just downloaded Displosimeter to the Displosimeter folder. So I'm going to CD into that directory and I'm going to make a utility called Displosifile, which is Displosimeter for files, so I can measure the randomness of files. And over here in my temporary folder, I have uh, a number of sample files and I'm going to explain to, to you what these files are in a moment. But as you'll notice, they're all about 600 megabytes. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and run Displosifile, which is in Displosimeter slash temp slash Displosifile. Okay. And it provides you with a syntax. Um, I don't want to go into all this right now, but suffice to say, uh, you can learn about it if you, if you need to. So let's go ahead and run that on random.bin. Don't worry about all these zeros. Um, basically, <clears throat> random.bin is a file that consists of totally random bytes. It was generated by my Inranda random number generator. Um, and so we expect it to have very low displacentism. So let's see what happens here. So in fact, uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 7, so that's very low. But in and of itself, do you really know if that's low or high? Well, uh, not exactly. You'd have to compare it um, to other reference points. So let's look at, for example, a zip file. Zip.bin is basically a 600 megabyte zip file, um, which is basically a popular compression format. I just took a whole bunch of junk files and I zipped them up and I chopped off the first 600 megabytes. Um, so it's the same frame size essentially as random.bin. Um, but because it's a compression algorithm, the entropy, that is the randomness, should be quite high. So is it possible that this BOSA file will still be able to ascertain that it contains an intelligent signal and isn't actually random? Well, absolutely. 
It turns out that, in fact, the Dispoisonism is three orders of magnitude higher uh, than with the random bin. Well, what about if we take an encrypted file? So here's an encrypted, encrypted dot bin. What happens in this case? So encryption should look like randomness, and in fact it does. We have 3.17 times 10 to the minus 7th with true randomness. We have 3.14 times 10 to the minus 7th. Uh, basically, within the vagaries of statistics, those are identical numbers. So the encrypted uh, file does, in fact, uh, look like it is uh, not intelligent, it's not artificial, it's random noise. Um, so this would be an example of where a file uh, would fail. Um, now, how about this other compressed format, 7-zip? So 7-zip was developed a few years ago as a technology update to the zip compression algorithm. It's supposed to have better compression, and in fact, uh, Displosophile can't actually detect that it's any different from randomness because the entropy level is high enough um, that it, it does look like noise. Now, um, what should happen is given enough information, which might be gigabytes of information, we would eventually find um, whatever tiny telltale uh, statistical signs there may be that 7-zip is actually uh, obviously a contrived data set, it's not random noise. Uh, but my hat's off to whoever came up with that algorithm. But let's look at this. Let's look at this uh, video file. So this basically is 600 megabytes uh, that I cut off the top of a, a big MP4 video file. So MP4, as you probably know, is a popular video format used on YouTube all the time. Okay, so this is uh, just a series of uh, still frames compressed into a video. Um, it's a fairly modern compression algorithm, so we expect it to look like randomness. And is it possible that we could discern this as an artificial or intelligent signal? Well, let's see. Yes, indeed. So it's still an order of magnitude. It's 10 to the minus 6 versus 10 to the minus 7th dispossonism. So in fact, dispossophile uh, figured out that this is an intelligent signal. Now you'll notice there's, there's nothing in this information, and don't worry too much about all this other data that's explained in the blog, but um, in, in all this information, there's nothing about where the intelligent signal is located inside the video file or uh, whether it consists of sine waves or repeated bytes or anything. There's no discussion of that or information about it whatsoever. But what it does do, again, is it saves us a ton of time by not having to analyze files that are pure noise. And, and again, as I've shown, there, there are failure cases. This is not a perfect filter. There's no such thing. But statistically speaking, I think it can help to push the odds in the right direction um, that we'll be able to find useful information in a tractable amount of time. So thanks for listening. Uh, post your comments, questions, complaints uh, in the YouTube uh, discussion section below. And uh, I thank you for listening.